Welcome to Shorty Supercoach and welcome to another player profile. Now off the top, we're going to start with a bit of a dark confession. I want to pick Jago Mira. I know I shouldn't say it. He's a mid-pricer in my midfield. He's awkward as hell. The body, those knees. What are you thinking, Shorty? But I've got to be honest. I've been thinking. I've been looking at him. I've been checking the stats. I've been reading the articles. But I want to pick him. I've got to be honest, that's where I'm at. But when I really think about it and use my head, I just don't think it is a good idea. But the positives are there. He's hard to resist. I mean, we've seen this young fella who was touted as a future superstar, destined to be a star of the game. And, and for good reason, he showed it. 2013, 90.1. Yes, we've got to go a long way back for his first season. 97.7 in 2014, verging on stardom already. And that's when the real problems began to kick in. No footy in 15 or 16. Finds himself a hawk in, um, you know, 17. And just the 63.8 points per game off just six games. And again, it was knee issues, you know, set back in June, returning to the VFL in August. Then he was back in the side round 22 and 23. But as I said, the positives are absolutely there. You know, this is a guy who has been taken to a club. They want him to be the main man. He's just a good run at it with his body off from being an absolute superstar. But unfortunately, he is in that category where now it's not so much of a matter of him just getting right and he'll be the player that we once thought. He's in that Daniel Menzel, sort of Harley Bunnell, uh, Morabito sort of category where he's had so much injury to that one area, that knee. Those knees are killing him for so long. It does make you wonder, maybe we, we might never see that version of O'Meara that we really wanted to all those years ago. It's, it's sad, but, you know, I'm a Geelong man, and, and I've watched Menzel for his whole career, and when he was younger, he was going to be an absolute superstar. There was no doubt about it. He looked unbelievable, fleet of foot, good in the air, a lovely kick. He's lost his mobility big time now. Defensive pressure is awful. He's lost that yard of pace. He's just never fully got back to it. He'll be a very good player, but he's never going to be the superstar that we all thought. Of course, O'Meara is probably in a different level to that. And I think, you know, clearly he's got a bit more talent and he's a different sort of player. But I think it could be along those lines of thinking that we've really got to select him on. And I'm not so sure we're ever going to see what we had hoped from O'Meara. Now, that's a tough call. I'm not saying we will never see it again for a weekend, but across a whole season, I'm not so sure. Now, for starters, why do I want to pick him? Deep down, it's because we know that he has the talent. I do feel like he's a good shot at on the park from producing some really good numbers. You know, that midfield is there for him to be one of the main men alongside Tom Mitchell. We know he has ability. We know he's a hard nut, can win his own ball. He's tearing it up at the moment pre-season. Intra-club, had 33 touches. Seven marks, six clearances, kicked a goal. All the talk out of Hawthorne is, O'Meara's not just getting through the preseason, he's lighting it up. And I think we've got to take notice. And you know what one of the big surprises was before I was doing this video? I thought, no, oh, look, O'Meara, I'll, I'll do him. You know, he might not be the most popular pick this season, but I think he's worth talking about. 25% of teams he's in at the moment. One in four. That really surprised me. 315k we'll have to pay for him. Now, that is just incredibly awkward. Now, there's guys like Brayshaw just above him, Armitage just below him, even someone like McCluggage at 300 or 297 or whatever he is. Not a bad option if you're looking at that mid-price sort of line of thinking. Now, O'Meara clearly of those four has the most talent. You cannot deny his talent, but this body, I'm just not so sure we can trust it. As I said, I've listed the positives. He's got a midfield position in the starting two or three, waiting to be had, waiting to take it as his own. We know he can win his own ball. We know he has all the tricks, a powerful athlete, a confident man. He can play the game. But these knees, the inconsistency with that, 
can he get back for starters? This man has played six games in, what is it, three years. Six games of AFL football. That's extremely concerning. Now, one little stat that I looked at last year is the kick to handball ratio. Now, his scores were reasonable at times last year. I'll go through them. Rounds one, two, and three. So he played the opening three rounds. Touches 23, 36, and 14. For Supercoach scores of 71, 89, and 44. Came back round six, 14 touches, 39 points, and that was the last we saw of him for a while. Returned round 22 and 23, 17 touches for 49 points, 25 for 91 points. If I turn my little page over here, the kick to handball ratio was concerning. And we all know in Supercoach, it's great to win contested ball, which he does, but it's also great to be able to use your feet, hit the targets, and ideally be a kick to handball positive player rather than handball happy. Now, in round one, O'Meara, nine kicks, 14 handballs. Six kicks, 30 handballs in round two. Now, why, why is that, you might ask? It could be a number of things. You know, I didn't see that game. I watched it on the radio, but well, I listened to it on the radio. It could be a number of things. He doesn't have the confidence in his boot yet. He doesn't have the speed to break away from a stoppage yet. Is that his role? Potentially. I don't think his role too often would be to get 30 touches and just six kicks, or 30 handballs, I should say. But I think he certainly is going to be more of a handball guy, but he needs to get that ratio closer to one to one. In fact, he only had it one to one on one occasion. That was seven and seven in one of those 14 possession games that I mentioned. Otherwise, on every occasion, he had more handballs than kicks. So that's slightly concerning for his scoring, which is why he had you know, 36 touches and only 89 points. As well, he had nine clangers, which doesn't help the cause as well. But I think that's something we've got to think about is, you know, maybe we're not just going to see him come back and light it up immediately like we might hope. And I think that's my worry is that for a guy to come back and just deliver on what we have maybe thought he would for years and years, would be an enormous step after just six games and battling ongoing knee issues. Not to mention, he's going to be naturally rested by the Hawthorne Footy Club. No doubt about it. If he plays the first five rounds, he's averaging 95, he's going great, this selection's amazing. The Hawks, you know, they're travelling, they're playing a weaker team. They'll rest him if they feel the need. They will manage him. That's where I feel O'Meara is at, and I think that's the biggest problem when it comes to looking at selecting him. He's in that category and a handful of players on, on most lists. There's always a couple where you go, he's a prized possession, but we want to get him at the business end of the season or in the games that matter, and we will manage him. He's a player we just have to manage to get through the season. He's not a 22-gamer player. He's just not. And that can be dangerous when we're talking a mid-pricer because we need to see him play all, if not you know, the majority of the first half of the season for him to really go up in value. Um, I'm more comfortable in picking a player. When it comes to risk, I'm more comfortable picking a player that I have confidence that he can score, and O'Meara has shown that. I'd rather have the confidence in the scoring and the doubt in the body because sometimes you can get your body right with a good pre-season. I'd much rather that than picking a mid-pricer where the jury is out on his scoring. That's always somewhat concerning because we don't know if he's ever going to hit those heights that we wish he would. You know, sometimes we have players that we look at and we go, you know, this is great, this guy's got all the potential to be a breakout. And inevitably, they never do. You know, they play 20 to 22 games each year, but they never really break out. Where O'Meara, I don't think there's any question on his scoring ability and ability as a footballer. If he's out there with a good preseason playing each week, I think we're going to see an average of more than, well, I could confidently say 95. I think we can expect 95. Now, that might be a little bit generous because I think there will be times where he's a bit sore or he doesn't quite get through the week as well as one might like because he hasn't played much footy over the last few years. But I think 95 is, is reasonable. Maybe it's 90. Even so, that would be great to have it. I'd imagine most people are picking him about M6 uh, around there. That's pretty handy. And he'll work his way up to that you know, what would it be, sort of 480, 520 mark, depending 
on the rolling three weaker. I mean, he'll work his way up and quite nicely. That's appealing, but there's just there's a lot of risk for me. And you know what I say often, guys, I don't pick mid prices in my midfield. My midfield is for me to spend coin where I know I can bank on points and be confident I'm spending my money and knowing what I'm gonna get in return. And on the other hand, you often get the best rookies as well. So on the lower end of the scale, you get the most quality. The upper end of the scale, you get the most quality. That's why I think the midfield should be purely guns and rookies. Because so often we see the top 10 to 12 midfielders be more or less the same. There's always those handful of guys that just deliver, deliver, deliver. They're the superstars of the game. And we see our top picks and guys who are getting opportunities through the midfield around the 120 to 200k mark. We see them often be the most successful cash cows. So that's my reason why I think the midfield should be set aside for guns and rookies. Don't look at mid-prices. It's what I said about Armitage. And it's what I'm going to say about Omira. You know, I... I really would love to pick him in a way, you know. The ego would love to pick him. I'd love to go, yeah, look, I put the faith in O'Meara. He's lighting it up. I had confidence in his body. Look, after seven rounds, he's flying. Look at me. And that might happen. That might happen. And if it does and you pick him, well done. But I think the other side of the coin is the negative. And that's what we see once again, what we've seen before. You know, injury gets the better of him. He's not quite right. He's not the player he was. I think a lot of people thought Manzo would be a better player than we always thought he would come back and be better than what he has been. You know, he was on the trade table. You know, a guy that's not locked into our best 22 when he's not quite right physically. And, and it has been an ongoing battle to get him up week to week. And you'd think he'd be going fine and all of a sudden, out, D Menzel. You're like, what the hell's going on? He, he looked good last week. And that's because we don't see inside the rooms. We don't see during the week just how tough it is for guys who have had long-term injuries and battled the knees for years and years. How tough it is to get up week in, week out. And it's just not as... If you have a tough game on the weekend or a tough session, you're just... You're going to recover much slower than anyone else. And, and, th and that can lead... You know, you've got a Thursday night game, you're not going to get up for it or even a Friday night. So I just think it's, it's an enormous risk. Don't get me wrong. Like I said off the top, I would love to go with him and I would anticipate I'll end up with him in a draft side because I think in draft he can take those sort of risks. If it doesn't work, you find another free agent. Where in Supercoach Classic, it's all about what you're sacrificing. You're probably sacrificing, well, presumably 200K from somewhere. You're either going 200K up from a rookie or 200 odd K down from a premium so you're robbing yourself somewhere else on the ground to go with O'Meara. You know, most people will either take 200K out of a forward line or a backline player to get their rookie up to O'Meara, or you'll have six premium midfielders most likely and you'll downgrade to him. Most people will be doing one of those two things if you try and get him in. And I just think the sacrifice is huge. I think there's a lot of good premiums in the midfield that are on the lower end of the spectrum. You know, you look at Cripps, I think Bottom Pally's at a good price. I don't even mind Trelaw. I think Josh Kennedy's a great value pick for what he can do. Joel Selwood's in the same category. I don't think we need to be penny pinching too much or trying to find these mid-price guys through the midfield. I really don't. And in contrast, there are some good mid-price options, I feel, in the back line and the forward line. I think Petrarca looks quite good. I would have said I was thinking about Dugowie. Clearly not now. He did make way from my side. But, you know, there's a couple of guys in that forward line. Um, you look at the back line. There's Pierce Hanley. I don't even mind Luke McDonald. Um, I'm sure there's a couple others I, I haven't mentioned. But I think in terms of how 2018's looking, how my team's looking, I can't see myself going with him as much as I would love to put a guy that I feel could be a superstar of the competition I really do. In a perfect world, I think he could be because he's got all those traits. But it's not a perfect world, and it only takes one little thing to go wrong. I mean, there's only one way the O'Meara selection can go right, and that's he averages 90-plus and plays every game for the first 8 to 10, and he goes up in price. That's the blueprint for a good selection, where there's a couple of tick boxes 
for it to go wrong. He misses early games, likely. He doesn't come back as well as we would have thought. You know, doesn't quite hit that 90 average. Or you could see both. You know, he could come out and go 99, 120, or he's injured. Or worst case scenario, he could come out and go 74, 68, 88. You know, Jaggy, he's feeling a bit sore again. Rest him. I mean, there's just there's three options there where you could get absolutely burnt. And that, that's what scares me. And in combination with my theory on getting rid of the mid-pricer from your midfield, it's got to be a no. So the heart, maybe it says yes. Maybe everyone wants to just pick a guy at the right time when he breaks out and you get a lovely 90 averager for 300k. That feels good. That warms the super coach heart. But unfortunately, I've got to go with my head in this opinion or in this occasion. And I've got to go with that there's far too many things that could go wrong. And there's only really one way it can be right. And traditionally, looking back at history, it doesn't often go right. So hopefully for Jaeger's life and footy career, hopefully it can work out. But for my super coach team, I've got some concerns. So he won't be in there. And I'm interested to see where you're at with him. Very interested. Let me know if you're picking him. Statistics say one in four of you will be. I'm surprised by that. But let me know how it's all going and, and give me some ideas for player profiles too. I appreciate a lot of you guys have been leaving comments with players. Hopefully I've been getting to a few of those and, and I've certainly got a list going as well. So thanks again for tuning in. Bit of a longer one today by the looks of it, but uh, hopefully you threw it on the podcast, put the earphones in, had a bit of a listen and enjoyed it. So thanks for tuning in. Subscribe away, comment on the video as always, give it a like and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.